to our third installment of Sundance Google Hangouts. This one's painting with light cinematographers. Today we have uh, Sean and John with us. Um, you guys want to introduce yourself? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm Sean Stegemeyer. I'm cinematographer. I am John Gulasarian, cinematographer. Um, how funny is that painting with light? Is that a yeah, reference? That was amazing. Me? We and we always joke about that as cinematographers when, when we're lighting on set. It's like, oh, this, this amazing brush stroke coming in through the window. What do you think about this? I mean, they're being a little humble. Uh, we worked on Beauty Inside. Beauty Inside, Sean. Yeah, Sean and John worked on Like Crazy, and right now in the festival, he has a movie with Drake during this called uh, Breathe In. But right now, let's introduce uh, our participants in the Google Hangout. Okay. So, all right, uh, I'll, I'll begin. <laughs> um, my name is Bobber. Um, I'm, I'm a freelance video editor, um, a cinematographer, and also a photographer, I'm mostly into landscapes and architecture. And I'm based out of uh, Los Angeles here in California. Yeah. My name is George Cohn. I'm a corporate video producer in Silicon Valley. Hi, I'm Peter McLaughlin. I'm a independent uh, film director and producer doing a documentary right now, and I'm in Toronto, Canada. Hey guys, I'm Scott Rosencrantz, a uh, recent film school graduate and uh, hopefully aspiring cinematographer. I'm looking forward to the uh, next hour discussion. Uh, I'm Todd Casey. I'm an animation producer from Los Angeles and uh, just a huge movie fan. All right, wonderful. Um, do each of you guys want to talk about um, cinematography and, and the filmmaking process for your movies? Well, that, that's going to cover the whole next hour. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, it was nice to meet everybody. Yeah, welcome. Um, I think. John deserves most of the credit here in that he's uh, has two films here, and in 2011, Like Crazy won the uh, Grand Jury Prize, and Breathe In is fantastic. I got to see it, was it yesterday that it premiered? No, it's two days ago now, yeah. Uh, and it looks beautiful, and um, the thing we have in common is that we both work for Drake DeRemus, who was the director of uh, Like Crazy and Breathe In. Um, so I guess I think the thing I'm, you know, I'm more curious to ask you questions than probably more than anything else. But uh, I, I think if anybody knows Drake's process, he his scripts going into it are supposedly a little loose to interpretation. There's yeah, not it's really like usually just an outline. Yeah. So I mean, I'd love for you to I guess elaborate on the script and sure. kind of what you guys do with it in yeah. Drake production. Sure. I mean, with Light Crazy, it was a very short outline that uh, I think it was about 42 pages or so. Um, and uh, uh, and basically all that is is him and Ben York-Jones, they, uh, they literally just describe the scenes. And there's not dialogue written necessarily. There's uh, um, sometimes there's a line or two that's written uh, more specifically. Um, but for the most part, it just says we need to get from point A to point B. This is what happens in the scene, and then it's all improvised. So it it becomes a little bit of a challenge in the sense of how do you, you know, let your actors go wherever they want, say whatever they want, but also keep it cinematic at the same time. And with like crazy, uh, you know, we just sort of decided to 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 focus only on the performances and, and sort of re-envision how we were going to, and I had worked with Drake previous to that too, in a more traditional way. Um, but we, we, we really wanted everything to just let the scenes breathe, allow actors to move within spaces, go wherever they wanted. Um, and then once we did that and we got it right and they found it, then, uh, then we would go in and pick up little things and, and make it work. And, you know, and and the, the interesting thing about that is we would roll so much uh, that there was just so much to work with later and you would just discover things. Sometimes the objective of the scene would become completely different. Uh, and at the same time, it left all this room to 
go discover other things too because we were we were moving really really quickly. So if we were setting up a scene, uh, you know, in one location, Drake and I and the actors could go out and just you know shoot a few things, make some things up, improv a little bit more, and a lot of those scenes ended up in the movie as well. So it's an interesting process. And then when we went and did Breathe In. Uh, we 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 really wanted to continue that and just sort of heighten it a bit more, uh, and that outline was even longer, uh, which led to even more options and more uh, uh, like yeah. we we had already done it already, so we really sort of felt like we had a great handle on on um, on what our aesthetic was in in this process. So it's been a great learning experience as well that I've just carried into all my other work. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I think uh, to jump back a step, I guess, away from these movies, we both uh, actually went to American Film Institute. So we come from a similar, I guess, story learning curve and how we kind of were brought into narrative filmmaking. Uh, John's a graduate from 2005. Yeah, I believe he was Drake. And I'm 2007. And so did you guys to shoot films when you were at AFI together or just meet there? No, we, we actually never shot anything together. I didn't. We didn't even know each other very well <laughs> at AFI, which is probably a good thing. And we sort of reconnected socially, like soon after we finished AFI, and uh, realized we had a lot of things in common. And he was making a a, a short film at the time that uh, he actually needed in order to graduate from AFI because he hadn't finished his thesis. <laughs> and, <laughs> that sounds very yeah. yeah. and. Uh, um, uh, and so, and he had five hundred dollars, and like we, you know, literally just sat around his apartment and prepping and and talking about shots and getting excited about it. And we met this little film that, you know, ended up, you know, being my favorite short film I ever shot. Which, uh, nice, yeah, it was amazing. And after that, we've just sort of, you know, whenever we can, we work together. Yeah. Um. For introductions and. Do we want to open it up to questions right now from uh, our participants? <laughs> Any yeah. first? You want to go ahead, George? Um, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> what um, what gives you the most uh, satisfaction on a project? Is it the collaboration or the uh, you know the technique or or um, uh, what are you in it for? For me, it's the it's it's the the collaboration when when you're prepping a movie that really gives me the most. It's the, just the sitting and and um, uh, and actually planning the movie and, and and getting excited about about how you're going to do it. Um, you know, the making of it, although that's that's exciting as well, is 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 much more hectic and uh, and stressful to me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think the, the pre-production and the anticipation of getting together and kind of working through what, what you really want to tell, how the story should be told, and, and the goals for how you want to shoot that, or, or you know, the actors to everything, um, is so much more creative and, and less stressful in the beginning. So uh, when you go into the shooting, it, it becomes a lot easier than also because you have worked on what really counts and what matters. So, you know, if the light's fading and you haven't gotten that thing or you end up deviating from the original plan but you've, you stumble onto something even better, uh, that part's the exciting time because you've already done the work of knowing what the purpose was to be there uh, and what the scene was and what, what you're going after. So then, uh, I guess that then the final excitement is then seeing what came out of that because you started with something, you ended up shooting it in this crazy different manner, and then you end up working out and getting the scene that was like and you never even really imagined. And and Drake's such a, a musical man that then with his editing and, and music and and amazing acting that goes into it, uh, it's it's pretty amazing to watch the final outcome. Yeah, agreed. And I think you always know on any project, like day one, like when you get there, did we did we prep this enough? Did we have enough time? And 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 you start to feel. And if you feel really comfortable, like okay, we're going to make a movie. It's almost like all of the work has been done. It's just the the like physical part that you have to do now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, Todd, a fire, aspiring filmmaker, um, you have a good question in the chat. Do you want to ask them? Yeah, what was the, uh, <clears throat> what's the most challenging scene or situation that you ever had to shoot in? You know, something that you just found especially difficult, be it, uh, you know, a, a scene in one of the films or a side project or commercial or even a student film? Mine's pretty easy. That's, uh, uh, I, I recently did a movie in London uh, with uh, Richard Curtis, who directed Love Actually, and uh, uh, you know was the creator of Mr. Bean. And, and um, uh, uh, the the main like well, the first thing I did when I flew out there to to interview with him, there was this great scene that he had written that happened all at Abbey Road Crossing, um, and it was a scene with twelve speaking parts uh, and a huge traffic jam. And uh, um, and it was a, about a five-page scene that happened at the actual crossing, which is a historic place that everybody knows. Oh wow! Um, and actually, in the interview, when the first time I met him in person, he was like, "We're just going over there to talk about this scene right now." Um, and we prepped that scene forever in order to to know that we had all the coverage that we needed. And to I mean, twelve speaking roles in one scene is very very difficult. Plus, you, you know, you you have like the probably the the one of the most touristy places you could possibly imagine where there's just this constant stream of people uh, coming through um, and then having to create a traffic jam there as well it was just it was insane um, and we actually built in a parking lot uh, a, a replica of Abbey Road crossing so that we could we brought everybody in even before we shot the movie and we uh, um, and and you know, we figured out where all of our shots were going to be from and, and in what order we were going to shoot them. And then on the days that we were shooting it, it was actually, it was one of those great London days where it's really sunny and then it's raining five minutes later and then it's sunny again and then it's raining. So that presented another challenge. Um, and then shooting it over multiple days as well. And, and the best part about it is that I just talked to him recently. He's like, yeah, we didn't need that scene in the movie. We cut it out. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Yeah, but it was a great experience. Uh, most challenging is uh, an interesting one. It was actually this January. Uh, it was shooting for a short film, and, and we were filming it in Iceland. And it was uh, much like Utah temperatures. It was freezing cold, in the snow. And um, it was, it's like a small personal project that we did that involved very few of us. It was. It was only three of us that were making this thing, so little to no crew, and uh, the conditions were extremely windy, and we had to film this scene with, that involved uh, this guy basically just kind of robbed this house, and he's getting away via kite skiing, if you've ever seen or know what that is, but uh, it, it involved basically, you know, you get these big rigs, and, and you're strapped in, and, and you have to kind of sail this kite, and the, the friend that I had that's a great skier and stuntman ended up having to go home. So we had nobody to do it. Ended up that I had to do it on top of <laughs> shooting this simultaneously. So uh, it became challenging because we, you know, we had the walkie-talkies. And um, my friends, I, I set up the camera for them. It was on an Alexa. And they're on a long lens, like over on this other ridge line. And we, uh, we start doing the scene, and they're rolling, and I'm like, you know, I hope they can even just keep the frame the way I said. All they have to do is pan. It's not a big deal. And uh, as we start going, uh, I start running out, and I clip in. I'm about to take off on this kite ski, and my, the helmet just completely fogs up. I can't even see a single thing. And so I'm, you know, I tell them, I'm like, oh, we got to stop. I, and I kind of kite ski over to them, thinking they're going to have the anti-fog solution that we were using to wipe it down this helmet. And they don't have it. It was left in the van like a half a mile up the road. And so then I had to, I was like, oh, well, it's going to take too long a foot. So I'll kite up there and go get it. I go to go get it and <coughs> almost trip over some lava rocks because it's in Iceland and almost uh, like basically break myself. But end up getting to this van. Uh, I'm, you know, sailing the kite above me and trying to dig through the back of the van to find this fog solution through all my luggage uh, and then end up finding it, go back down, and, and we end up kind of succeeding and getting what we needed to it. But that was uh, probably the most interesting 
challenge and <laughs> probably not the most <laughs> realistic thing that most people will face, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, speaking of challenges, I, I know we don't want to go back to promoting the movies, but I think Peter had a good question about the challenges of, you know, are you on the same page with your director, and how do you figure things out so you guys have the same vision for a movie? Um, you talk about your work with Drake since, you know, everyone seems to know him now. Sure. Um, I mean, with me, uh, you know, I, I like to sort of conform to how the director wants to work. Uh, and hopefully that I, I can bring my experience and say, well, this is a great way to shot. This is how I like to shot this. Uh, and or this is, um, you know, this is how I would approach this particular scene or whatever. But, you know, you also uh, really need to respect their process as well and, and, and find that common ground. And usually that's done in pre-production and, and hopefully by the time you're shooting, uh, you guys have sort of created your own method to work together. And, you know, like Drake's method is, you know, you're one of the few people that can, can understand how <laughs> that is because it's, it's totally different than anybody yeah. else's. Um, and it's radically different as well. Uh, but that's what I think makes his movies uh, what they are and that gives him his vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's great to be able to, to enhance and and, and, and build on his vision yeah. and collaborate. I have a question from the internet <laughs> on that. So for um, the films that you've shot with Drake, it's been a little bit more um, like on the fly. And for you, doing the short film you guys did, it was a little bit more scripted. How did that work when you were working with Drake on um, the answer? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like our script for this kind of commercial series we did is probably about as long as your feature scripts were, <laughs> but uh, it was it was definitely more outlined and scripted in a sense. And Drake is is hilarious because he wants to basically get on set and, and if we be ready to like see something, discover something, and and move in that direction to be able to shift quickly or like you know find what's working and go with it and not. He hates to, to be tied down, I mean, just in general. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> uh, but going into that, I mean, I think it's, it, was, it sounds like the same process where we were trying to be as specific as possible about what the story meant, what really mattered, and how we best thought, like, you know, with location scouting and, and theoretically how we wanted to shoot it. But on the day of, I don't think we ever really actually looked at the, we never even looked at the shot list, uh, but the, the script also, I don't think we went back to it all that often except for these like key kind of product or like certain things that we had to do. But most of the time when we we're uh, shooting the day of, it would be, you know, oh, the light's coming from here and, and the actors actually like they look good doing this, or it's working if they work over here, that. And then you just kind of move with that kind of rhythm, on, and, and Drake loves that. And that's like what he thrives on, is being able to work with everybody and just and adapt to the situations. And I think the script ended up, um, you know, I never even looked back at the first scripts from when we were shooting to what ended up being there. But I, I know on the day it was all just... You know, do what you can to make it work and, and adapt. Cool. Um, he was really into just to add to that. He's really into momentum. Yeah. It's like it's, and I think that that it's it's there's an energy on his sets because of that too. Because you are constantly moving and you are you know and the actors aren't sitting around for a long time or going back to their trailers too much. It's just constant. Like let's just keep going. Let's keep going and let's shoot as much as we can. And uh, and he he intuitively knows like. What, what, like when he's sort of crossed through, he calls it the zone. Like once he's crossed the zone and he's like, okay, we're done, we've got it, like let's go, you know? Yeah. And, and sometimes, sometimes that takes a really long time. Sometimes you're doing tons of coverage and you're trying to find different things and sometimes you intend to do that, but you set up one shot and it runs and he's like, okay, that's it, that's all we need, let's go. <laughs> so. I love those moments when the producers just get like kind of shocked by like, that was it. That was like what I needed for the scene. Let's move on to this other thing. And sometimes when that would happen to us, people were just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Yeah. <laughs> um, let's, let's take a question from uh, Bavare, if you could. Yeah. Um, actually, I just wanted to. Uh, I had a question regarding cinematography as a more of a, from a career standpoint, um, because I had the opportunity opportunity to actually visit the AFI for the open house they had. Um, I think it was two months ago, and um, they, it was a pretty good um, time I had with the faculty. Get got to meet them, and I was pretty impressed with the fact that I felt like at the end when they're rolling the credits as to how many how many students graduated from AFI and and you know like who've made it up there like it felt like as if almost half of Hollywood came from AFI you know <laughs> <laughs> and I was like you know um, I just um, I just wanted to know like how what are the chances of success as a cinematographer and let's say if there's a class of 50 students Right, and to make it up there, or to you know, to get up in the you know in the A list category, or like in the B list categories of you know, um, cinema, uh, cinematographers in the industry, um, in Hollywood. So, do you have any secrets for them? Like, yeah, I would say <laughs> you know, I wouldn't worry about how many people are in the class, or or, or you know, I think the 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 uh, the enemy of all of us is is is, is competition. Um, because it's really just it's about you it's about your what you want to do what your path is and the, the reason that so many people are successful that come out of AFI is because of their curriculum there and 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 their real focus on storytelling and and, and that's what makes a, a, a great movie is, uh -huh. is a great story and everybody in any discipline there cinematographer editor screenwriter director producer um, yeah, the, your uh, production designer. You're all you're all working towards telling a story, um, and the great thing about it is that it is it, it's it, it's it is located you know right in Hollywood, and and so you have access to a lot of the industry as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, but I think a, a lot of people also come out of there and and like we have collaborate with other people that they met there, other people, you know, you always have this connection with people from the, the, the American Film Institute, uh, and, uh, and there's something special about it, so, but it, it, I, I had an undergrad degree from Columbia in cinematography, which was also really great, uh, but that, I, I came into AFI very technically minded, and, and not necessarily focusing on storytelling, mm -hmm. um, and really learned how to, to 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 translate that into to uh, a a, a more creative means of telling a story, uh, and that's that's what I got out of it. And I think as a cinematographer, you really need to have both sides of that coin. I think it's also oh, sorry. Go ahead. You had to say something. Go ahead. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, what I was saying is also I guess uh, it's also I guess about well the two things either it's luck and it's also about uh, meeting the right people knowing the right people I guess that also help, Matt, you know, helps a lot in terms of uh, getting the Definitely. right projects and you, and you never know where that's going to happen it's not yep. necessarily at a networking event or at a <laughs> like you, you yeah. I've met people at Ogre Games that I've ended up working with so. well <clears throat> can I sorry. ask if sorry. it's oh sorry Sean I mean to talk over you well, I was just going to continue on the kind of <laughs> AFI cinematography camaraderie. Is uh, I also uh, went to Chapman University undergrad for cinematography, so we kind of had a similar, um, I guess, education. And I learned so much technically in undergrad that coming into AFI, my focus was just trying to learn story better and and meet people. And in AFI for cinematography is extremely difficult because your first year you're you have to crew for everyone else, meanwhile trying to prep your stuff and do your classes. So it ends up this like seven day work week, just like boot camp, uh, I mean military camp sort of feel to it where you just, it's never ending and it's grueling. And I think that's what's unusual about that school versus you know some of the other film schools is that when you come out of AFI, you feel like you've gone through this like incredible process together. And, and when you meet other AFI people, you get this, Understanding that, like we've we've gone through this learning curve, and that's yeah. that's what they told me uh, at the orientation. They're like, once you come into AFI, <laughs> yeah, like, is... like once you come into AFI, 
forget about your family. <laughs> you won't be having time to talk to anyone. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's, it's actually really hard to uh, yeah. continue your, I mean, just in this industry in general, it's very hard to continue relationships and uh, with friends and family, and people don't understand how hard you work and how much you work, mm -hmm. um, but it, it takes a real effort in order to, to, to make that work. That's true. But if you can't find the commercial work, you're also working on shorts. You're working like it's just work. Just go. Be motivated. Don't worry about how many people are around you, how many people are in your class. And I was just going to ask you, do you believe in that? Like it's just you have to have the chutzpah. You just have to go. You have to find the work or collaborate with other people. Um, and it's not always going to be a paying gig. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I... I am a firm believer, like when I came out of there, it was uh, right when the writer's strike was happening, then we went into recession. It was kind of, I think, one of the worst times to be getting your master's degree and, and coming out of school because then you're just left with even all these professionals having a hard time working. Uh, so I kind of went through the same thing of, you know, what do I do to try and make a name for myself? And it came exactly from that as you know, find the projects or little small things, whether it's shorts, music videos, commercial, whatever it is that you can, that you connect to and you want to be proud of when you show people, whether you get paid for it or not. I, you know, I would I'd take stuff that I wanted for my reel and then I would also do stuff that paid that will never end up on my reel. And yeah. you kind of find a weird balance there to survive and, yeah. and not and like what you can get away with like the bare minimum of living versus yeah. being, you know, still creative in some capacity. Yeah, I think it's also important to do what you do. Like, yeah. don't you know? You don't want to get out of school and 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 you know go and be a gripper and electric if that's not what you want to do. Because once people know of that, know of you as that, it's very hard for them to make that leap and to to trust you in another position. And I think it's really just about living modestly until you can 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 really get some traction. Um, and it, and I mean, free jobs, doing things for free. Are, if if it's something that you believe in, and something with people that you believe in, it can very very quickly turn around. And I did a free job during the writers' strike, and I, I had you know been doing some television and, and things like that. But I did a free job just somebody who had emailed me, and it led to like years of work. It was just a bunch yeah. of people who were. Um, you know, oh, it's the writer's strike, but we're going to make this pilot and nobody's going to get paid, and so it's going to be okay. We, you know, we just want to be working right now while the strike is going on. And, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, that ended up being something that paid my bills for a while. And, and so. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think working with people, like you guys were saying, that's probably one of the best ways to network, doing favors for people, because, you know, if they have a project, they'll, they'll contact you about it. Um, Wanted to go to Scott real quick if, if you had any questions for, for them. Uh, I have hundreds of questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I mean, do you want it to relate to to what what's going on at Sundance right now with that? No, just whatever yeah, most interests you. Yeah. I mean, uh, so so would you say like um, I mean, what's what's something about like the creative process in like developing developing a shot sequence or like working on set that you feel you've learned from either like failing, whether it comes to like framing or aesthetic, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Like some, something about the nature of like existing behind the camera. So the storytelling process and the creative side. Yeah, of it. sure. I think whenever, whenever you do anything you're learning, um, I, 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 every project I come out of I feel like I, I've learn something. And it's sometimes not until you see the final product that you're like, oh, well, that could have worked better, or that worked really well, or that worked not as intended, but it worked really well, and that we intended to do something and it didn't work at all. And, and, and you just sort of accumulate all of these things in your head, and hopefully, you know, you go from project to project and, and, and you bring all of that with you as you go. It's, I mean, I think you, it, you learn from experience, of course. Yeah. Uh, I guess to continue on that, I mean, when I was finishing AFI and even when I did the, my thesis film there, I was trying to be as meticulous as I could. I, would, I was a firm believer that, you know, as like craft, perfectly crafted and blocked and everything we could do beforehand, 
uh, would make the day of go that much smoother. And then uh, when I did my thesis film, it was almost just too perfectly staged. Everything was just so glorious. I could have the prettiest lighting, and it evolved in all this, all the way that I wanted it to. And <coughs> whenever when I look back and see the film, I realized how uh, like stagnant I, I put the whole production in by a, you know making it that strict of shots and rules and like you know every perfect sweeping dolly shot jib shot everything we had was so crafted that it I it lost a lot of humanity and a lot of emotion that we you know wanted out of the story and so a huge thing I took away from that that you know has evolved into the way I work even now is to just you know like do not let yourself get tied down so hard and as much of as much prep as you can do to have, you know, this big light outside the window that's going to do this special thing that you think is going to be so great is uh, you really just need to know what purpose story-wise that's going to serve and if that's even really that important the day of to be able to move on and, you know, if everything can always happen on sets and, and there's, so many, there's so much that is going on and you get behind schedule that you just you sometimes can't do those things. So you have to be kind of adaptable and I think that's going back to Drake why it's such an amazing like thing to work together and John can attest to this that it's like you I guess going into it know that so then when you're there you're only there for the story and then you kind of you know who cares if that light wasn't ever what I thought it was going to be but it became something else because the story was working that much better for us. Yeah, Awesome. I um, want to go back to Todd. Seemed like you had a question ready. Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> if I was writing a western, say I would watch Tombstone and Once Upon a Time on you know in the West and read about Jesse James. And I was wondering if you know when you guys get a new project, do you immerse yourselves in any particular material, be it stills, or you watch you know your favorite cinematographer's work, or you know like what did you, did you watch anything for uh, for like crazy or or breathe in or you know your um, any of your commercial work, Sean? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, movie references are always great, especially, and the, the great thing about prepping a movie is that you, you go into this with, with new people all the time, and, and everybody has their favorite, you know, moments in movies, and, and you get to sit around and, and watch all these things, and what, what's a, a great thing is that you know, usually you talk about these things a lot, and 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 you know, even hopefully you you eventually watch them together. But um, uh, what's me and Drake have noticed sometimes is that you know you'll talk about a scene like how you remember it happening and how you remember it making you feel, or a movie and how it, how it made you feel, and, and and you both we both feel like we're on the same page. Like, oh yeah, that's really great. And then you sit down and you watch it, and you're like. Well, wow, that doesn't feel anything like what we wanted to, but like, like, how do we get that feeling that we both felt like we, you know, had when we saw it? Um, I mean, uh, without getting into too many specifics, like, I, we definitely watched movies uh, um, together. I've, I always do that. I, lo I always push directors to, to do that as well. Um, as well as anything else, like a big part of Drake's process is music, a big part of a lot of directors process is music. Um, uh, Drake's great because he'll actually make, you know, every creative member on the team like a CD to, like, to go with the script, you know, and all the actors and everybody get this CD. Um, and that, that's really nice, it's like you really understand the emotion of the scene. And, um, and a, lot of, a lot of directors love uh, looking at artwork together, uh, you know, talking about just stories in general. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I kind of have a question, and maybe Scott, you want to take out your pencil and write this down, but I'm kind of curious kind of what questions you guys have in the camera and everything like that in terms of equipment and technical stuff. Um, yeah, I guess camera-wise, that's kind of probably an easier one for both of us right now, but uh, I actually own an Aria Alexa, so that's my obvious choice. And um, I think most of my education, and I'm imagining John's as well, was shot on film. So the the quality and, I mean, everything really we've ever watched growing up was, was always film. So this 
digital evolution to me uh, has finally culminated into Alexa being the closest thing to react the way that film would react when I was learning and, and all of the images I can remember and recall from my favorite movies were films. So that's, I mean, kind of why I chose that camera. And I know Breathe In was shot on uh, the Alexa as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I love the Alexa right now too. I've always sort of, been, I, I've, I love shooting film and I always did, but I've always also embraced you know, whatever. I mean, like crazy, we shot on 70s, um, and, you know, that was a new thing at the time and something we felt we'd like to experiment with. And um, and I guess in, in the way I look at it is that it's really just, you can tell the story with anything. What's the most appropriate way to tell the story? Um, and if that happens to be film, that happens to be film. If it happens to be digital. And that's not necessarily only because of what it looks like in the end. A lot of it has to do with just the process as well. If you, you want to shoot really quickly, you want to shoot in a lot of low light, you want to shoot, you know, you, then you pick your camera, you pick your lenses based on that, you pick the way you're, you're recording your media based on that. It's like, you know, do I need a big hard drive on my camera so that I can get a better quality image or do I need, you know, or do I just use like cards that stick in it even though it's, it's, it's not necessarily going to be technically the best thing, but it's going to be the best thing for the movie. Um, and I think that you, know, you just need to think about all those things when you're prepping, um, uh, and, and, and every time it's going to be different. And, and, it, and it's moving so quickly right now, too. Yeah, yeah that it's like, you know, in six months, yeah, you know, next everything year can be different. Yeah, next year will be something so. else. Who knows? And, and also, yeah, you have to think of the final outcome because if you... You think of like a 3D movie that is going to have a lot of visual effects. That I mean, it's not. You'll you'll probably hear that epics used more often, or um, that you probably wouldn't see them shooting Super 16 on yeah. something like that. So uh, <laughs> it just depends. And then you know we've been talking about the how it's going to be on set and how you're going to function there. And so. Uh, I don't think either of us would ever really throw Drake into a film situation again because he's a constant like move, yeah, move, yeah. shoot. Let's look at this again. Likes to, you mm -hmm. know, we always are, you know, constantly referring to what we've done. And so it's uh, that would never be the situation. But you know, if I were to go tomorrow into like a depression era western or something, then you know, I, it's very feasible that I'd look at film as an option. Yeah. yeah let's uh, let's go back to Canada Live with Peta. Uh, <laughs> You have a question for them? Well, it's just you guys are obviously talking about Drake being more of a fly by the seat of your pants kind of operation where you don't really know when you're going into the shoot how exactly you're going to shoot it. And there's not necessarily, your actors aren't going to hit a specific mark. So how do you work with that? How, how do you sort of light it optimally? How do you shoot it optimally when you sort of don't know what's going, like that sounds uh, very collaborative, like it sounds much more collaborative than a lot of directors because you're really both in it together dealing with the situation at hand but at the same time what bag of tricks do you use to to go into a situation like that? It doesn't just have to be Drake. Other yeah, yeah. Too. Yeah. I have to say, like the the uh, I have, I don't think Drake is necessarily a fly by the seat of your pants. I think he's extremely specific, and I've never started a project with him without it being completely shot listed. Actually, and yeah, like Sean said earlier, sometimes you don't look at that shot list, but you always have that roadmap, and you always know exactly what you how you want how you intended it, and it's almost like your fallback option, but it's it's one of those things It's like when you read it over and over again and you really, it just, it, it's it's in your head and you, you know exactly what you want. Um, uh, and yeah, and he's, uh, he's a firm believer in, in beautiful imagery and always wants it to look amazing. He's not there just to like, I only care what the actors do and you're just going to do whatever I, you know, go along with. But uh so he's there in, in, in scouting and everything he's doing is like he's there to reinforce you to make the best images possible. And so he's always constantly asking like, you know, well, you know, would it be better over by this window or would it be better over in this corner? What I, you know, like where do you think it would look best? And then we'll like kind of work with it and adapt. But, you know, on that same line, yeah, I don't think we really bother putting marks down ever because you want to 
let the, the freedom be there. I've actually carried that um, onto a lot of other work now too because I, I found that um, actors really appreciated it when you weren't like, hey, stand here, hey, look here. It's like, it, it's because it, 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 their performances are affected by that. And, and, and I usually ask, I mean, a lot of actors will say, hey, tell me where to stand. Um, but most actors really like appreciate, like, you know, it'd be nice if, you know, when, like, the director will always block it and we say, well, get in the area and we'll, we, I don't want to box you in, basically. Like, that's something that I, I you know, when, when learning, you, you end up doing a lot is like, it, you end up boxing your actors in and forgetting that, like, this is about performance. It's not only about this one image. And, and a lot of times, and at, at those moments, you're working with less experienced actors, too, so nobody's going to tell you any different. Um, but a lot of times you see how that's affected, where it's like, oh, but I want to lean forward like this. And you can't just say, oh, well, that's not how I live. It. That's, yeah, it's like it, you really want them to be able to do everything that they do and, and to be able to act. Um, so it, it, it's it, things end up being a bit more natural and a bit more broad in that sense with Drake because you that's really the extreme of it is that you know sometimes they'll walk into a room and 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 have never seen the room before so you don't know where they're going to go and it's uh, it, the the fun challenge of that is anticipating it and saying well if this happens then this is going to be great and if this happens then I'm going to move over here and that'll be better and then maybe just in in the moment. Uh, uh, figuring it out as well, and just you, you know, let, like following your heart too. And there's also other, you know, other relationships I've had where we'll take, uh, you know, viewfinder or the 5D or whatever on our scouting, and or if there's a uh, a rehearsal or any blocking rehearsal where we'll move through the move, and if it needs to be some elaborate kind of dolling jib and lights and it starts to get more complicated then uh, then it's good to walk through and be do the flexible part early and find what you need and if it is like this crafted specific thing that's not so much about the dialogue and it's a very movement oriented thing then uh, it's best just to get it you know really mapped out early and then when you come back the day of or if you then go into lighting from there on uh, it, you're just you know that much more specific, and and with the uh, assistant director, you can plan out the day based on you know all these complicated moves or anything like that. And so uh, that's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum if you're going for like you know some sweeping, crafted, big lighting setup, something like that. Yeah, and I mean I think we've talked a lot about the actors and directors' relationship with you guys. Um, how do you think the editor's role plays into that? Do they have any input or impact on how you guys you know, light the scene or, or things like that? I wouldn't say lighting necessarily, but I mean, I love when editors are involved very early on and, and you can have those discussions, especially when they're people that you've worked with before and you, or you understand their work and you understand where they're coming from. And it's, it, it's, <coughs> it's quite nice, too, to have um, uh, that feedback because you have somebody who's who's the, another eye that's watching what you're doing every day and saying, hey, maybe you should have got this shot. Maybe we could pick that up, or um, you know, and when you do this scene, make sure you get me this because it's going to be really nice. You know, it's a it's another collaborator that you have, and it's really great. I know a lot of little movies don't even hire their editors till after they're shot, yeah. and that's that's always a tragedy, I think, because it's it's. You're missing that point of view the entire time. Yeah, and that editor is there to you know enhance the story and put his perspective and, and mold it together just as much as you are. So you know, being able to have have their opinion if they are there and be like, you know, <coughs> make, are you guys actually going to get this or get that? And just that opinion is great. And uh, I started out in an editing background, I guess, from out of high school into college. I thought I was going to go into editing, but. Uh, I think that ends up helping your cinematography a lot if you can understand the editing and then even if you have to edit some of your own work, I've learned uh, a tremendous amount by what I wish I had shot or you know how I did shoot things and then I'm in the editing session going like, these two just do not cut together at all. <laughs> um, I think we have a question from George. Yeah, that actually, you just answered part of my question and, and the first part of it is, um, you know, do you all edit? Do you uh, uh, go through editing and and um, 
to what extent does it affect uh, the way you shoot? I mean, you, are you always looking out for the guy that has to you have to hand this stuff off to? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a huge part of our job is because you have to make the whole film flow together and and not only just from a story standpoint, but just <coughs> physically watching it, it has to be seamless. And you're constantly thinking about, you know, your, you know, wide, close movement, cut, like everything is related to how this story is going to flow. So editing is a gigantic part of that. I think whether we do it or not, we're constantly editing in our head with the shot list and going through the day and, and shot to shot where things have come from in the scene before to where we're taking them in the next scene and, and you always have to be aware of you know this scene I'm shooting like two months down the road but we're doing the scene before and now and it's going to end in this like tight close-up thing and then we're going to cut to this big wide establishing shot that's on a dolly or whatever and like understanding that cut and transition point is huge, especially, you know, we think about it for, for color purposes or, or all sorts of reasons, but, I mean, in our head, we're already editing as we're imagining, so, Do you, uh, uh, I think it's a huge part. I think our understanding of how a movie gets cut together is really a big part of our prep as well, and that's another reason that the editor should be involved, It's because it, I have that conversation every single day when I'm storyboard, or storyboarding or shot listing with the directors. You know, you can cut from this to that, and, you know, at this point you can cross the line and then you can use this, and it's going to, you know, that would work really well at this emotional beat, and that's why I want to give you this additional coverage or whatever. You know, or even down to the simplest thing, which is, you know, this would work really great in one shot or anything like that, which, you know, is a, is a whole other thing. It's, it, it becomes, how is this movie going to flow? How is this movie going to be paced? And how is it going to move from scene to scene? Cool. Um, Peter, did you have uh, another question? Well, I've, asked, I've asked directors this question, and it's sort of like what you're saying, is that as you're shooting it, you sort of cut things together in your head, and then when you actually get into the editing suite or it starts to be put together, how does the overall film, do you find, change? Depends on the film, I think. I mean, a lot of times it change, changes drastically. Um, a lot of times, it's exactly as it oh, was. Oh, really? Okay. Exactly as it was shot listed. That's probably more rare. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, for the most part, things always move around. It's it, it, you know, you don't really know if the story works until you see the story work. And and as you get better and better, you get closer to that, closer okay. to being more specific about it. Um, but uh, yeah, but you, you just, you, you can't always know. And sometimes scenes that are supposed to be at the beginning of the movie end up at the end. And that, that's why you go back and do reshoots as well. Reshoots are a huge part of making a movie. It's, it's uh, you know, what would be really great right here is if this scene happened or we had this emotional moment or, what, you know, it would move the story along. But the first act's a little slow, so we're going to cut this out and add something over here. Um, you know, and if you don't have that, you, you often go back and get it. Awesome. Um... Scott, we know you had a hundred questions. Do you want to give us your second one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, well, I mean, this this one just came to mind. The one I just typed is um, is like working on like like crazy and the the beauty inside. Um, I'm I'm assuming like this is your first time working with some of these actors, and like each actor obviously has specific facial features. So like, are there any are there any like interesting or unique lighting tricks you guys use or think of to bring out specific facial fa uh, facial features when like working with people on set? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone's you, you really get to know the good thing. Um, that, that, you know, that's the reason we do tests a lot of times is that you really want to get you want to familiarize yourself with the actors. And when they're actors that have done a lot of things, you you often just take some time to immerse yourself in all of their work and see. You know how they how they uh, how they photograph well. Like what you didn't like. Like you know, is it okay to shoot this person from a low angle? Is it okay to shoot this person's profile? Do they still feel like the same person? Um, and you really, uh, you know, one thing that I like to do is just on a test day, just bring all the actors through and 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 throw different kinds of light on them. Just you know, how does this Chinese lantern work? How does like a bounce into a muslin? How does the like, Aquino flow through this work? You know, things like that. And just start to familiarize yourself and understand. And as you go along in the process, you um, you, you learn more and more and more and, and, and you start to understand. The great thing about um, d 
doing uh, Breathe In after Like Crazy was working with Felicity a second time and, and really getting to know her and understand, um, you know, how, how and she's, she's an easy one. She, you can photograph her from pretty much anywhere, but you really understand where the emotional beats work from different angles and all that, too. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head on that one. And, and the other good thing is uh, I can recommend is if you can get or tell them to get proper stand-ins that are at least in yeah. the ballpark of your actors. And, or stand-ins at all. Yeah, stand-ins at all. <laughs> that that uh, is yeah. huge. And, and after a while, when, you, when you're on a longer project, you'll soon to adapt to what works and what doesn't. I mean, that that's kind of... The thing about like day one and two that is kind of usually is a curious time and you're kind of finding your feet together. Um, so it's as a recommendation, I mean, if you can with your AD, schedule the easiest stuff you can on the first day so that you can just kind of work your way into, you know, all the collaboration. Because, you know, if you go out of the box on day one with some of the most difficult stuff, you're, you're probably going to end up reshooting it or hating it. <laughs> Um, Actually, that's a thing with uh, every movie I've ever done with Drake is we always joke about like when the movie's done, how much of day one or day two <laughs> got used in the movie, <laughs> and it's usually very, very small, if nothing. Yeah, but Barry, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question to ask. Um, okay, it's a fun one. So, so far in your career, uh, <laughs> has there been any director who has given you a hard time, and if so, what, what was it? Uh, I name names. Yeah. <laughs> um, the only times that's happened with me is uh, when the director or when the schedule ends up falling behind to the point or things become so difficult that the stress just stacks up on them and they just kind of make you do things that aren't so pleasant and, mm -hmm. and you bump heads and you're just like, ah, this just is not going to work. and and you kind of have to do stuff for schedule's sake or, or whatever. But uh, usually that's the only time I've, I've run into a huge snag with directors. Otherwise, I mean, the, that's a big part about prep and going into something is you've got to get to know them, get to know what they like and how they're going to function. And if you haven't done that properly, then you're going to probably end up in some more situations that might end up kind of ugly. But if you can get on the same page and really just bond on what the story is you're telling, then when you get into the shit, you'll end up coming out of it like fighting together as opposed to hating each other. Yeah, exactly. So has it been early in my, in my career, like working with younger directors who uh, didn't necessarily um, know how to collaborate with a cinematographer, and a lot, of, and a lot of times I find myself saying like, "Tell me what you want, don't tell me what where to put it." You know, it's like, because a lot of, like, younger directors especially would say, okay, put the dolly track here and put a, this lens on. It's like, well, well, you know, tell me, like, you hired me for a reason, so tell me what, how you want it to feel, and yeah. then and we'll collaborate on that. Um, uh, and, and you learn as you go on, like, when you're meeting with new people, like, the personality types that you think you're going to click with, too. And that's a very important part of the process, I think, is, is actually having these conversations with people before you even agree to do it a job with somebody and understanding that is this going to be worth it for me? Is this going to be a, a true collaborative experience or I'm going to just be a tool for somebody? Yeah. Because I, the, the reason is because, uh, the reason I ask this question is because I um, mean there are some directors out there who come from a cinematography background and they end up, you know, you sometimes have a clash in let's say creativity. Okay, you know what? It becomes too nitty gritty. I want this particular shot this way, this way. Has it ever come across? Have you ever come across situations like that, or, or sure. like in <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, arguments, creative argu like uh, arguments, you know, in terms of creativity? Sure. I have a rule actually, which is when I'm when I'm on set, if if a director tells me to do something and I offer them another suggestion and they say no, I'll ask them one more time and after that I'll do it their way. Um, because I, it's it's not worth it to 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 fight over it. And if the you know if the relationship's not working then you know part ways. So. Yeah. We we got about five minutes left. Um you know, well, staying with the fun out and good Well I, I am in a budding director. So could you give me sort of a quick what what to how do I speak to a DOP to get my vision across and let them do their thing? 
I mean, that's really what I would want it, why I wanted to come here today because it's like not wanting to make the decisions for you, but at the same time share that creative vision. And again, like everything we've been talking about, I think leads into that. It's, it's being on the same page is really the important thing. It's looking at these things and understanding. Like what I love, I just worked with a great director um, on this little movie who, who approached it and he's, he's been a writer for 30 years and he said, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about what you do, but I know when I think that something has worked. Um, and let's look at those things that I love, and you tell me why I like them. And I, I really liked that process, which was, and you may know a little bit more about visual language um, than that, but I, <coughs> I really liked the idea of him saying, okay, look at this scene that I really love from the movie, um, and this is how it made me feel. Tell me, why do you think it made me feel that way, and what can we do to, 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 uh, to explore that with what we're doing? How do we apply that to, to what we're doing? That's, uh, I, wish, I wish a lot of directors did that for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a really nice thing to do is going in and kind of look at references and really talk about like why it's doing what it's like doing to you, your feelings or emotions or, or tonally, like what, what it is doing, I guess, like bring that to the, the cinematographer and just discuss and then, um, and from there, the more you can talk about those things, even if it's, they're far away, like, cause I mean, a lot of times you're prepping and, and sometimes the cinematographer, you're on different jobs and you end up not being able to get together till kind of the weeks or a couple week or whatever, right up until the shoot. And so whether it's email or not, just kind of bounce back and forth, some references and really talk about like what it is in that, that, that you liked best and why. And, um, and especially just like what it's making you feel and, and relationship to how it's going to work for your story or what it is you're doing together. Yeah. Can I add one more thing to that too, is that the do it without any humility as well. That's the important thing is that, you're not supposed to know, like you're hiring them to do a job. Yeah. If you have a question like, you know, what does that term mean or why do you keep saying this? Like, like ask the question because it's, I think what's hard in any of these positions is when people try to like be know-it-alls about everything because we all have our own job. I don't know anything about, I mean, I, I know what I know about directing, what I've learned from directors, but I'm not a director. Um, you know, and, and, and I think it's, it's just a matter of having that sort of open dialogue all the time and, and not being embarrassed to ask any questions of each other. I'm sorry. And also uh, talk about time frames too, like when you are going into something, like kind of anticipate how much you want to be doing this like scene for, how, you, how long you think you need for it, or like at least just how much you care about each part of it more than the other, because you know, on tight budgets, tight schedules, you're not gonna you're not gonna be allotted like all the time you need for everything. So, you know, be specific about like this means a lot to me to get this right here and this, and usually that's all revolves around the story anyway. So you, you should be on the same page. But uh, I get a, a little frustrated and annoyed when you know sometimes we'll be setting up something elaborate that theoretically I thought meant a lot to the director, but then we like end up stuck with very little time for something where he needed a lot more time and maybe even didn't quite realize it, but uh, that can screw us up quite a bit. Yeah. And don't hire somebody that's going to roll you over either. That's another important thing. You really understand the, the, the relationship that you're going to have. You don't want to hire somebody that's going to push you into doing things that you don't want to do because you're the director and that's a very important role. Yes. <laughs> um, the, John said something great about the humility part is like the, the time you can't spend beforehand. I mean, try and even like maybe do stuff that puts both of you outside the box too because the earlier you can get over the fact that you're like, well, think you're trying to be as best as you can and like that awkwardness at the beginning of the relationship, mm -hmm. uh, the more you can just kind of laugh about it and laugh about each other and it's going to go that much better because then when you're on set and something isn't quite right and isn't quite working, there's no personal attachment to why like you think their reason isn't quite right or they think your shots aren't quite working. It isn't gonna come out of something like malicious or personal. You'll it's there for the you know purpose of what you're doing and not you don't have to get your egos in the way. 
Cool. Well, we got about a minute left. I have a question from Twitter. Um, can you guys tell us a little bit about DPs that you look up to and their work that inspires you? In one minute. I know. <laughs> I think I, I can use this reference because in film school, it was like one of the first movies I had to write an essay on, and it made me kind of dissect things a little further. Was Road to Perdition. Uh, that Conrad Hall shot, and I think that was my first eye-opening experience to like very meticulous craft of color and uh, and and movement, camera, movement, everything was just like is so detailed in that film that that just like awoke me from some sort of weird sleep that I now could kind of judge a lot better. And from there, I mean, there's a whole slew of people that I think we could both go into. Yeah. But um, I mean, and, and then from there spawned like a lot of Terrence Malick love and, and Roger Deakins and so on. And yeah, I would say so my, many. my most influential would, would have been Harris Savides, one of, especially the work that he did um, on, uh, you know, Elephant and uh, the work, all the work he did with Cus Van Sant, I think, was really inspiring. Just the, the way that they thought outside of the box and, and, and and about telling a story, and what it was so untraditional, and and just being able to take those risks and to say, you know, okay, we want this, we don't have, we, you know, we have this budget or, or whatever, but let's, you know, let, let's really just push it as far as we can, um, it, as far as storytelling goes, and I think that's really inspiring. I think taking risks is so important. Cool. All right. Well, we got to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Tomorrow we have another cool hangout at two p.m. with a. Uh, some really good screenwriters, so try to RSVP and check that out. But thank you guys again and everyone out there. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You yeah, thanks. That's awesome. Thank you. Come here.